Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Facebook Live. My name is Jeff Palmer, the CEO and founder of Clean Machine. And I have some very special guests today uh, who are supporting the vegan community in really unique ways. And I think very timely, too, in this explosive part of our uh, vegan industry and marketplace. So if you are considering opening a vegan business or you have one already that you're having challenges with, these two can offer some great insights and help. So before we get started, let me do my uh, thing. This video is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. So today I have the pleasure of speaking with Lisa Fox and David Pinnell, the founders of Vegan Business Tribe. And they do this by supporting vegan entrepreneurs to help their businesses grow and thrive. They also uh, run Promote Vegan. This is a vegan consulting agency advising some of the largest global food manufacturers on how to meet the needs of the fast-growing plant-based marketplace. Lisa also writes uh, a monthly column for Vegan Food and Living, and they are both in support of vegan certifications too as well in the UK. Welcome, both of you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, I, I don't think I could have put that better myself. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, being a vegan business owner myself, I have really enjoyed a lot of uh, your uh, podcasts, your, your posts. They're always very insightful and great information. Now, I know you've, uh, in some of your comments, you've posed this as um, the Vegan Business Tribe is more of a give back, whereas the Promote Vegan. Let's talk about what the slight differences between those two are and, and why you formed them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the easiest way to explain it is just talk a little bit about our own vegan journey. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and I've listened to a few interviews that you've done as well. And I, I love where you're coming from and where you first came to veganism. And I think everyone has that moment and everyone has that journey. And so for myself and Lisa, when we first turned vegan, we did what everybody did. So first of all, you look at the food you eat because that's the obvious place to start. But then you move on to the clothes you wear, the cosmetics you're, you're putting on your body. Um, then you look at, you know, what, 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 what other things you're doing in your life that might have animals in it. But at some point, you get to that point where you say, well, what am I actually doing with my time as well? And that's exactly what happened to, to, to Lisa and I, wasn't it? Yeah, we, we looked at our skill set and wondered, you know, how we could actually use, kind of veganize our skill set to help the sector and help bring about this vegan world and things. So our background was in uh, marketing and business growth. We'd run quite a successful agency for quite a while. And so we decided to take our skill set and move that into the vegan sphere. And we realized very quickly when we were trying to sell a consultancy to vegan businesses that vegan businesses have no money. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that that whole idea of taking our skill set of you know helping businesses grow and market themselves, you know, we were making a lot of noise about this because we're as Lisa was saying, we're marketeers at heart. But what we found was the people who actually had the budget to engage with that and you know who really wanted that knowledge were the non-vegan businesses. So we started to get approached by some of the high street restaurant brands, you know, the food companies of saying to us, actually, yes, you know, we're entering this marketplace, we don't really understand the consumer. How can you help us? So we actually fell into doing that for um, a couple of years perhaps um, but then we were actually asked to go give a presentation at VegFest UK at London Olympia here in the UK um, and usually when I was presenting I would be talking about vegan consumer buying behavior you know quite technical marketing stuff but Tim who runs VegFest he said do you know what would make a really good seminar if you can just talk about running a vegan business and how to have a vegan business because that's something which I think a lot of people would be really interested in and I was kind of like well it's not really what I want to talk about it's not going to attract the audience I want but you know you, you are a friend I'm trying to get you know in with the events you do so let's try it out let's just do a seminar on how to run a, a good vegan business and we turned up to that and we had 60 or 70 people in the room it was standing room only and we looked at that and then we realized you know this was our tribe these were the people we were trying to help but we couldn't help them but with through consultancy through you know one on one charging agency fees but if we could help these people in a collective way and bring them together then we could actually work with the customers who we wanted to work with so vegan business tribe we actually ran it completely free for the first year didn't we lisa yeah. Um, 
So we were just trying to figure out what it was that people wanted. We didn't want to put something together like we did with Promote Vegan and try and sell it and realize it wasn't going to work. It was a case of, okay, well, these people have been attracted to us and, and what we're doing and our message. So let's figure out what it is that they actually want. Um, so we spent quite a while building an audience as Vegan Business Tribe and putting out this weekly content. And after we'd been doing that for about eight months, we said, okay, well, you know, we would we would love to help more. Uh, what would you be willing to pay for? Would you be willing to pay for the content? And they said, we love your content, but no. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they, they kind of, the, the people who've been following us uh, built it for us based on what we asked we said what do you want it to be and they said we want help we want things like networking as well we want a community and we want to be brought together and we want to uh, have guidance with regards to what we're doing which is where vegan business tribe was actually born with regards to what it's become today and how it's moving forward is being driven by the members themselves as well so real uh, collaborative birth of this. Uh, and I, I like that about the vegan community. And I feel that this, the inner support of um, other vegans, uh, but also people who are interested and are open to learning are really supportive. Um, but we're seeing some amazing growth. And I know you feel it too uh, from some of the larger CPG companies that are jumping on the uh, plant-based man wagon right now. Now, some of them are, are doing it because they see it is the future and um, it's where the money's gonna go. And I always say, you know, uh, that the largest companies are gonna follow the money and the money is where the consumers are. So whatever the consumers are buying, they're gonna have to produce. So it's nice to, you know, for the longest time, consumer, big consumer companies were artificially creating the demand for their products. So they were sleep talking the, the consumer into buying their products for their reasons through marketing and advertising efforts. And they were putting out crappier and crappier and cheaper and cheaper products. All of a sudden the, the consumer starts to wake up and say, wait a minute, no, I should be telling you what I want to put in my body. I want something healthier. I want something more plant-based. And now the dog is actually wagging the tail instead of the other way around. And we're seeing the, it's so funny to see multi-billion dollar, even trillion dollar sectors of the industry changing for a group of very vocal people who are saying, no, I want this. Now, the whole climate change is kind of putting an onus on them to say, hey, wait a minute, this is not even sustainable. Even if we wanted to perpetuate this, it's just not sustainable as a business. We're running out of farmland. We're, you know, we're we're destroying the things. We're killing our best customers <laughs> through the diet. This is not sustainable, is it? This is not good business. So when something can bring them more profit, can sell at a higher uh, price range, uh, can be make the consumer happy, give them what they want. These are all wins. I don't care if you're a business believer or not. You're going to do it because of the money. So with all of this shift we're seeing people come in but we're seeing some of these companies not in touch with the mindset not Absolutely. in touch with the consumer and to go out there and be disingenuous with your messaging is a fatal <laughs> fault it and is but I, I i mean just to jump in on that jeff yeah you know, I, this is such an interesting conversation to have because what you'll actually find is that the biggest companies who are actually you know making huge moves with vegan products at the moment they are not vegan companies and this is something that a lot of people don't realize you know people like um, oatly who, who make the oat milk you know they had one of the super bowl ads this year everyone thinks that they're vegan with a vegan message uh, they were set up for people who are lactose intolerant but they've just found it very convenient to sell on the vegan message you know because as you said that is what is hot at the moment and if you look at somebody like uh, you know moving mountains or, or beyond meat with their beyond burger their own research statistics say that 93 percent of their customers for their meat replacement burger are meat eaters 93 percent vegetarians and vegans don't even get a look in and that's why these big companies are getting so excited and that's why to us vegans they're making some missteps as well because they're going after the non-vegans because they see where that market is but the problem they have 
is that you know this two to three percent of the population who do identify as vegan we're noisy <laughs> we make so much noise so you know when they get it wrong and they do get it wrong and, and you know that is something that, that we have very much you know consulted on in the past with companies when they get it wrong we let them know about it and and so what they've realized is yes they've gone out looking for that flexitarian marketplace you know the people who are doing meat free mondays and you know cutting down on the dairy intake and things like that but when they get it wrong it's the vegans who are really bringing them to heel and saying look you you, you need to get further with this you need to engage with us as well and and that's what they're finding now it's just creating so much bad pr when they get vegan wrong that they're having to get wise to it well and and i know you which is interesting you guys have uh, taken the vegan business support approach because that's what you do that was what you mm -hmm. grew up in your workplace exactly and, and for me you know i was a, a junior olympic athlete so i was training for that and you know I, I love physical fitness it brought me so much health i suffered from severe depression so the fitness part really helped with that and then when i changed the plant base it really just I never had a day of depression like that ever again in my life in that's 36 years. So I'm really thankful for what that did. So for me, it was like, okay, well, how can I help people? And then education, nutrition, and fitness. All right, that's a great start. Everybody eats and everybody needs to move or exercise somewhat at least. And that's a great place to start. But it's really cool that everybody is finding whether you are into clothing, whether you into books, writing books, or uh, every business sector of life can in some way be touched by this. So it doesn't mean you have to go out and just uh, create another Beyond Burger, right? It's <laughs> that's not where everything is going. You can do it in any walk of life, like marketing, like PR or, or book writing or supplements in my case. You know, it's it's for everybody to be able to get this and start living true to your own personal ethic. And I think we're seeing a lot of that now. And, and thank you for what you're doing and supporting others. But in that shift, though, um, we see in the news, at least, and maybe it's just the news that's giving an imbalanced uh, view. But it seems like, you know, uh, oh, you know, Beyond gets another three hundred million dollar investment. Uh, this one gets another billion dollar investment. It gets a billion, raises a billion dollars. It's like it's all the food sector. And I'm like, veganism is so much more than food. And there are so many other people in businesses saying, hey, hey uh, where's my funding? <laughs> You want to talk about that? Of course, Lisa. Yeah, I again just to just to uh, talk a bit more about what you were saying there. It's wonderful to see so many different types of businesses, you know, owned by vegans. Um, I think we've had quite a few people come to us before saying, um, you know, well, sure, it's you're mostly just food businesses. Will I fit in there? It's like we're not. <laughs> You'd be actually be really surprised. We've got um, a whole load of uh, service-based businesses you know we have vegan accountants with us and vegan designers and ve just any any sector you can think of pretty much vegan lawyers yeah. you know as well as vegan b&b's vegan hotels there's so many different types of businesses it's just it's it's not all food at all um and it's wonderful to be able to support them as well in in their mission because we're all, we're all on exactly the same mission. But yeah, people haven't been realizing the extent to which people have actually been veganizing their skill sets just like we did. Yeah, and, and I think that veganizing word is, is the important part of that because a lot of this is hidden. It's very much a, a, a shadow industry, a shadow service industry um, because a lot of these companies, they don't lead with the vegan message. So they're, they're vegan owned, they're vegan run, they, they work on vegan ethics, they are trying to move us towards a vegan world, but a lot of their customers don't realize that they are you know, a, 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 a actual vegan company. And that's really important as well because what we always say is if you're a vegan company and you're just selling to vegan vegans you're kind of missing the point of being a vegan company you know we, we, we are very much trying to move this scene forwards and get more people you know onto plant-based diets and to consider plant-based and so if all you're doing is just catering to other vegans you know they're already there they're already on that journey what you can do to make the biggest impact is you can set up a vegan business that does vegan by stealth and we we, we do call them our, our little vegan ninjas don't we sometimes we do. <laughs> <laughs> you know the, the, these sort of companies that are going out there they haven't got vegan plastered all over their shop front or all over their website but they're the ones who are making the real difference because they're starting so many people on their journeys 
And, and speaking of that, uh, uh, you know, the smaller companies saying, hey, uh, when am I going to get some love? Let's talk about the investing part of it, because I know, you know, uh, I, I see so many people who have the passion, who have the love, who have the commitment, maybe even some OJT, some on the job training in their in their particular lifestyle and say, hey, wait a minute, I'm going to make a product that's better, that's healthier, that's plant based, that's vegan, that's certified and done they get the they get the you've got the people who are passionate you've got the passion you've got the the product but then they go out to the market and it fails and that breaks my heart because i see such amazing people with amazing products and not succeeding in business because they don't understand the process mm -hmm. they don't understand how to be profitable they don't understand the nature of working within a competitive environment, of a retail environment, of a direct to consumer environment, how to blend your margins, all of the nuts and bolts that really make something. And I'm like, man, I, I so want to help these people. But how do you get them? Because I, I see the very typical thing. I do a little consulting myself for just oh, wonderful pro, pro bono for, mm -hmm. for vegan businesses that I really shine with. Um, and and I uh, the, the very first thing I start up is start backwards. They always start, okay, I want this product and it's got this and this and this and this and here's the price. No, 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 you gotta go look at what the market is willing to pay for of a product in that category and work backwards from there. Okay, you gotta take 50% from profits going to the retailer and then work backwards. Now this is what you've got to work with. Can you make something awesome <laughs> with that and 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 it's it's a shame because by the time they're getting into the marketplace it's already too late they've invested in the product they've invested yeah. in other things and they end up failing and i really love what you guys are doing by helping people not make these fatal mistakes in business yeah. Yeah, because that's heartbreaking. And, you know, we're all trying to work towards a vegan world. Like, that's our mission. Mm -hmm. And we can't have a vegan world if most vegans are rubbish at running bu a business. <laughs> like, then, like, then what happens? Um, so we need to be able to prove that this vegan economy can work, that it can work incredibly well, and that we can upskill all these amazing vegans who have amazing business ideas, whether it's a product or a service, and that they can run very successful businesses because again this whole thing about uh, a lot of vegans hating making money and especially from other vegans it's like yeah. you as we always say you you can't you've got to have a sustainable business to be able to make a difference and you can't make a difference in the world with a loss you know you need to be right. making a profit and you need to be successful as a business and we need to keep pushing this business scene forward um to help create this vegan world we're just not going to be able to do it otherwise yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I mean, just jumping on the comment you made there, Jeff. And first of all, you know, thank you for doing that pro bono consulting. I mean, vegan businesses need all the help they can from people who've already grown a business and who, you know, learn some of those, you know, just, you know, essential basic business skills. But what you said there is so many uh, vegan businesses, they have the passion, they come up with a product, and then they take it to market. And again, completely wrong way around of doing it you know what, what so it's too many businesses they go out to sell what they want to sell because they want to sell that thing and that's right. not the right way to build a business the way to build a business is to build an audience first learn what that audience wants and then learn how to meet their demands and you know and, and fix their problems so i think too many people go about it the wrong way they top load a business and they will spend you know sometimes years getting a product right you know getting a website online getting the branding before or they've even sold a single thing and the best thing you can do in business is just as quickly as possible get the you know uh, the, the, the the lowest common denominator you know get get that um just that first product out there in the marketplace and into people's hands and then learn from those people and not enough people do that they, they want everything to be 100 percent perfect they want the website to be right they want the colors to be right and it it, it isn't just test because, I mean, myself and Lisa, we, we've been fortunate to run our last two businesses together. Before that, I think Vegan Business Tribe is maybe my sixth or seventh business. And what I've learned from that is the most important thing is just to test, test, and test again. Mm -hmm. Because if you've got an idea 
You don't want to waste the next five years of your life on that idea if that's going to be a dead end, if it's just going to fail. You right. want to almost try and kill that idea as soon as possible. You need to prove that it's going to work or not work very, very quickly. And again, that, that's the problem I think a lot of businesses do. They don't go through that fast testing stage. They don't say, let's just take something to an audience and see what the audience wants. They, they build the thing first. And then, you know, it, it's, it's very unfortunate that they've actually built the thing, but nobody's really looking for well, and it's interesting to get other people's feedback. And, and I love the way you've structured Vegan Business Tribe in a collaborative community type setting mm. where you can breed that cross pollination and, and, and sharing of ideas um, and, and honest feedback from a community that, you know, look, every, every entrepreneur that I've ever met takes so much pride in their baby that they hate hearing any critical thing. It's like, like their own personal human baby, uh, you know, being criticized. Uh, because they put so much of their heart into it and, and absolutely I get, yeah I, I, absolutely. you gotta, you gotta take the criticism no, but, of course you do but but we are in the era where you can build a business in public now and so many successful businesses do you know i, I mean some of the guys i follow on twitter who, who are build uh, guys and girls i should say sorry you know who are building amazing businesses they're posting every single week what, what their figures are you know what they've tested this week what parts of their business have failed and they're doing it in public and it's very very you know it's very very acceptable now to build a business with your audience and you know do it collaboratively because the most important thing in a business is getting that feedback from the people whose problems you are trying to solve if you are you know building a business especially if you've got an e-commerce business and the only thing you actually know about your customers is their email address and the last thing they bought then you're in big trouble it's a bit like, you know, trying to do a comedy routine when the audience is sat in a different room. You just don't know how they're reacting to it. So, yeah, you know, the more we can do to actually engage people with the audience they're trying to sell to, that audience will have all the answers to any problems you could have as a business. So uh, every once in a while, companies um, not only become successful, but in this day and age of social media where things can go viral, they become wildly successful too fast. <laughs> and they hit growing pains, uh, especially we're in, we're in a booming category of plant-based, which the growth by lots of different uh, major players uh, is we're seeing doubling, tripling over the next decade. Uh, if you hit on something, it could literally double and triple in a very short time. Can you handle the production? Can you handle the inventory? Can you handle the cash flow constraints? Do you have enough capital to meet the demand? Because being out of stock of everything for six months while you run another run doesn't work as a company. It's not sustainable. So you want to you want to talk about that and just some ideas and tips for people um, coming coming to the forefront with some great ideas, uh, but how to handle business growth in a managed growth style. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want to handle that one, Lisa? Or do you want me to handle um, it? I'm sure you'll be able to chip in as well. But I think uh, one of the most important things, and it's it's a lot more difficult than it sounds, is to, uh, when, from the very beginning and at every stage throughout your business, to make sure that you're building in a scalable way, you know, with regards to how am I going to scale this? How am I going to scale this? How am I going to scale this? <laughs> to be, And you might not have all the answers, but at least if, if you do start booming relatively quickly, you'll have already started those kind of thought processes. Something else that makes a massive difference uh, in conjunction with that is contacts and connections. Because if you need help quite quickly, you need to be able to reach out to the people that you already know and the people that they know and the people that they know. So this kind of... Uh, some sort of community or some sort of network or you've built up your connections and people who are very well connected as well uh, the more you have of that then the better because the last thing you want to be is to have not really thinking thought about scaling properly to not have a network to be able to ask for help and to not have any sort of mentor who's done it before to be able you know you're just going to be on your own and you're going to be sinking quite quickly yeah. And that's such great advice because I think uh, the mindset for so many people, especially startups or, or um, even serial failing <laughs> entrepreneurs, they have a mindset of I'm going to fail this time too. And they never prepare for success, you know, mm -hmm. and, and never think of the long-term picture. And 
And, and that's a shame because if you're not prepared for success and when it comes, you won't be ready for it. So, um, yeah, I, I actually think, Jeff, that that is a really um, you know important point that we don't talk about enough because, you know, businesses scale over time. And if you've never scaled a business before, you just don't know where to go with it. But you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you've got a business and you think, OK, you know, I, I've tested this. I've got people actually giving me really good feedback. I managed to make a few sales. You can just go find somebody who has scaled a similar business, and especially if it's a vegan business, because vegans, you know, like you've just proven, love to help each other out. And, you know, we, we, we're all on the same mission. So if you can find someone who's already done it, you can go and learn from them. And that's a lot of what we try and do at Vegan Business Tribe. I mean, we go out there and we, we interview, you know, some absolutely amazing companies just to find out how they did it, and especially scaling, because that's the mm -hmm. question everyone's got to have. And what Lisa was saying about mindset is just so important, because we've, you know, we've had some, you know, members and businesses who have said, I can't scale because I simply can't make enough of a product. And they're still making the product at home in their garage or their kitchen or something like that. And we're saying, you've got to get out of this mindset of being a producer. Um, you know, if we take somebody like a Miami Burger, you know, who's one of the big uh, meat replacement burgers, you know, here in the UK, um, when he was uh, running a single, or, or rather, when he was providing a single restaurant selling, you know, maybe 10 burgers a day, he already had the factories lined up to make the product because he realized that he didn't want to be sat there in the kitchen putting out these products he needed to be able to standardize a product so that each one that got served was you know exactly the same and he's now you know he's got into the supermarkets in the uk he's selling all our big online retailers and all the pub chains and things like this and from day one you know he did not want to be making burgers um, but i think a lot of people don't go into that mindset they think that they need to make the product themselves when instead a lot of the time you can design the product yourself prove that it works and then look at scaling up by getting someone else to do the work for you and and that's interesting too and and, and scaling most people think of as applied to um products hmm. but there are definitely a lot of people who love services but as a service you have one person yourself <laughs> and, and you have so many hours in a day how can you scale that <laughs> Absolutely. Do you want to say that, Lisa? No. <laughs> <laughs> no it, it, I tell you what, it is exactly the same. It comes back to that mindset as well. So uh, at the moment, I mean, we're working with somebody at the moment who, who is very much wanting to sell their business. Um, you know, and it is a service-based business. And that is the exact problem they have. You know, the moment they walk out of that door, that business has no intrinsic value whatsoever. It's got no um, it's got no assets, you know, it's, it's got nothing such as IP or something like that, you know, within it. So when you get to that point, what you actually have to do is you have to design yourself out of the business. So you have to look at your service business and say, right, how could this business run really, really successful without me in it? Because a lot of entrepreneurs, they're the limiting factor in that business. Mm -hmm. If they could just get out of the way and let, you know, build something that doesn't rely on them being the bottleneck, they would have far more successful businesses. But it's hard to do it. You mentioned it yourself. We get so emotionally attached with our babies. You know, when we're building the business, we say it has to be me. You know, I have to be the one doing it. Mm -hmm. But there is so much out there in terms of online services, you know, that you can use in terms of technology and apps. Um, there is so much in terms of, you know, the freelance scene and the gig economy and things like that you can bring in people to do things that don't need your skill set and you can just concentrate on being the entrepreneur building that business and then just getting the hell out of the way yeah. and again all that's a lot easier if you're thinking about that from the beginning you know we've been asked that quite a bit about vegan business tribe as well you know how, how are you going to scale if you suddenly got another 100 members tomorrow how would that work it's like well that's, it would make no we're difference. All, that's yep. why we're always thinking about that we were thinking about that from the beginning mm. because it's unfair to your clients or customers or whoever you're working with um to not be able to deliver that service if if things suddenly get get a little bit bigger or you you grow back but you know by double overnight or something it's mm. it's you've got to be thinking about that from very very early on with with the growth of the industry also uh, enters the scene of a lot more competition a lot more me too products mm -hmm. uh, with that you, competition tends to drive price down which is generally a great thing for the consumer right <laughs> products get cheaper but it can push small businesses right out of the market um so one of the key things that i get some of my consult co consultees 
to focus on is your unique selling points or your points of differentiation in the market. I think this is where small businesses can come into the marketplace without that direct competitive price pressure and allow them to stay in the marketplace by selling on their uniqueness rather than trying to beat them at the flavor systems or the price points, which is what all the big boys can do so much cheaper than you could ever do. <laughs> um, and talk about that and, and how to guide people to have a strong position in the marketplace before going in. Because look, everybody can do a pea and rice protein. Everybody right now <laughs> is doing a pea and rice protein. Mm -hmm. So the only difference then is price point. And if you're going to get in there and get a slug fest with some of the big guys who are buying from China, at, you know, at two dollars a kilo, and you're paying six dollars a kilo, you're not going to win at that game. You're not. <laughs> the, the first thing to get around with that is the mindset. Again, a lot of this it is keeps mindset. Back to mindset. It does yeah. uh, because again, if you if you're worrying about pricing, then you're not. Value, either valuing what you're doing or creating or you haven't figured out its value yet um, and you're never you're never going to be able to beat everyone on price so you have to figure out what your value is yeah I, I i think if you're if you're losing out on price if you're losing customers if they're not buying you because there's someone cheaper then in your customer's mind you are just a commodity you might as well just be selling a box of screws or something like that because as lisa was saying you haven't proven that intrinsic value of what you do and a lot of the time i think when people are looking at pricing they get you know they get snagged on the whole idea of what a product actually costs to produce so we look at material cost labor cost and then try and add the margin on that and a lot of the time you know as you were saying yourself that's the wrong way around to look at it what you need to look at is how much does the person value the problem that your product is solving for them you know and and, and as long as that problem has value to solve then you can you can charge whatever you like and and, and people don't like selling you know, especially vegans, people don't like going out there and, you know, trying to get a sale and trying to make money. But you're a problem solver whenever you've got your own business. You are solving problems for customers. And imagine if you had a health problem and you, you went to see your doctor, you know, that doctor is going to give you the problem and that problem, sorry, to resolve that problem is going to need a sale. You know, they're going to be selling you some drugs. They're going to be selling you a procedure. But you will say, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. And you don't feel like the doctor is selling to you because they, they are solving your health problem. And it's the exact the same when you've got a company. And coming to this whole point of, you know, unique selling points, um, USPs, it's more than just having something to set you apart from competition. If you don't have something which is remarkable about your business, you will always have an uphill struggle trying to market it. And this is something that we try and really, you know, drum, hole to our, drum home to our, our members at Vegan Business Tribe. You have to have a remarkable business. If you don't have the sort of business that when I encounter it, I have to go run home and tell Lisa all about it, well, you know, over our evening meal, then that is just forgettable and you're never going to be able to market that business. You will have to pay for Facebook advertising instead of people sharing your story you will have to pay for magazines to put adverts in their pages instead of magazines calling you because they want to write about what you're doing so a lot of the time in developing this business and looking at pricing and things like that too many companies just are not remarkable enough and people will come back to me and say but i make a boring product you know i don't make anything that's exciting or remarkable and i'll go back to them and i'll say nike nike makes shoes how dull is that but they are seen as one of the biggest companies in the world because how they position themselves, how they market themselves. So it does not matter what you actually make as a business. You can make the dullest thing in the world. And I've worked with some of the companies who were probably in the running to win the award for the dullest product in the world, you know, and they have been astonishingly successful companies, um, you know, just because they've had that story. And when you're in the vegan marketplace, if you are mission led, and you know, one thing we always say is you should never, um, you should never start a business. You should launch a mission. And the companies who do that and are mission led, they use that mission to be their USP. And it doesn't matter what they're making; they can be yeah. just making, you know, uh, like I say, pea protein. Um, if they've got a mission behind it that people really want to align with, then they can charge a premium price for it. 
It was it was interesting. I, one of my favorite shows on television is The Prophet with uh, Marcus Limonis. I don't know if you get that over there, but uh, uh, he talks about people, product, and process. And yeah. it, he has the, this watch company, right, that just shot up in sales because uh, they were mission based. Ten different watches, yeah. ten different causes. They donated ten percent for the purpose for the purchase of each watch. And the watches were very affordable. You know, under forty bucks for a watch. Really cool looking. But it was the mission. People said, like, my mom died of breast cancer. I want to support that. So yeah. they had an emotional connection with it. Yeah. Right? They yeah. skyrocketed. They were doubling and tripling in sales, right? And, and then he said, what happened? Your sales not only dropped off, they dropped in half. And he goes, well, we got away from the message because our, our retailers didn't care about the message. They just wanted cooler looking watches. And he yeah. says, if you're going to try to go against the the billion and, and mega million dollar companies as watches, they can beat you at that game. What made you so successful as you were con connecting with a consumer? When you talk about mission driven brands, mm -hmm. guys, uh, people, we have an opportunity to here to raise the vibration, to raise the messaging of what we are doing with products. This is our time, you know? The, the big businesses have had zero ethic. It was all about the profit and the bottom line. We get to bring something new. Like every single one of our proteins sold, we donate a, a plant-based meal to a starving child throughout the world. So uh, everything that goes through our register uh, through uh, uh, credit card purchase, 3% goes to elephant aid. Um, every quarter we do a give back of 10% of all of our sales goes to a nonprofit doing good things for the plant-based community. So th this is an opportunity. Profit isn't just about, you know, <laughs> lining your pockets, getting rich in a big house and playing stuff. It's about an opportunity to change the world we live in for the better. And and how do you how is that for a legacy? Yeah, how is that absolutely. For work? <laughs> I, I mean, I I love what you're talking about, Jeff. And again, thank you for doing so much. You know, with your business, you know, to actually to be giving back to the communities and things like that. It, it is so important. But let me just give you an example of exactly what you said. So we have a member called Geraldine Stark, and her company is called Refarmed. Now, how excited are you that she makes oat milk? <laughs> Another one. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, and, and that's it. So you think, yeah, a, a great. Another person making oat milk. So, however, what we farm to do is they actually help dairy farms transition from making dairy to making oat milk <laughs> straight away. Thumbs up. What else they do is that farm has to agree to become an animal sanctuary so that their current stock mm -hmm. of, of animals live out their natural lives, you know, and then they produce oat milk. So, they have got that mission. They have got that story. And I've told, you know, so many people about Geraldine Stark and Refarmed, you know, and, and, and just doing that. And they've done it so far as a pilot. They've done it with three farms. It's gone wonderfully. They're now looking to actually scale up and get this into mass production. That is what's going to make them beat Oatly one day, you know, because like you say, Oatly, and a lot of people don't realize this, but Oatly are not a vegan company. That They were set up back in the 90s for people who had lactose intolerance. You know, we, we talk about these plant-based companies blowing up. Oatly were 20-year overnight success. You know, it, it took them a long time to, to get where they are today and and some clever marketing in the last five or six years. So yes, you know, you can make what you are doing remarkable. Even if you're just making oat milk, like, you know, 500 different companies, if you've got that mission at your heart of what you're doing, that's how you become a remarkable company. And I'll tell you what, you know, Geraldine with WeFarmed, she doesn't have to pay for advertising. She doesn't have to pay for social media ads because everybody shares her mission for her. That's an amazing story, an amazing brand. Mm -hmm. This is the opportunity that uh, plant-based, vegan, green uh, entrepreneurs have to change not only the products, but the way we do business, the way we interact with each other, the collaborative efforts. This is a new ethic that can extend in everything we do. And, you know, when I got into this business, I'm standing right, uh, I worked for Vitamin Shop, one of the, the second largest retailer of supplements in the United States, probably the world. And, and I'm standing in the middle of the store and half of the store has got all the health products, right? To promote health and wellness. 
And then you got the sports nutrition with steroid using athletes on the cover, you know, and, and dangerous chemicals and stimulants that are just lying. It's just bad marketing, untruthful. And, and, you know, I'm like, what does that got to do with health? It seems like, and so my mission, not only for my own of wanting to put the, to go out and find the absolute best plants in nature and bring them to market where other companies won't do so because it's too expensive and they can't make as much margin. They can get the cheap, you know, heavy metal laden crap from China and sell it and make tons more profit. It's not about me. I'm, I'm interested in people's health. And, and, you know, I, I, I said that and, and I looked at this industry and I said, this is an opportunity for me to be a piece, no matter how big or small, but a piece of saying, look, I'm going to do business differently. I'm not going to, uh, you know, my protein costs four to 10 times more than anybody else's protein in the market. And I don't care. I can make that fit in my pricing model, make it profitable and bring it to market because nobody else will. So I will be the only one out there in the marketplace with it. I will give, be giving people the best possible protein plant source, the only plant source with vitamin B12 in it, naturally occurring, bioactive B12. This is something special. This is something unique. And for those who want it, yes, we got free press. We got Live Kindly pick us up. We got all the major uh, New Hope Media picked us up and ran with uh, Mike the Vegan did a whole uh, presentation <laughs> on us and stuff like that. And our sales exploded. So that can be the driving force. You don't have to play the game as it was dictated by most of the previous people, which is make the cheapest damn product you can, make a lot of profit, and then hire some star or celebrity to be the face of your brand to convince people to go buy your cheapy crap product. It doesn't have to be that way. We can do business differently by being ethical, by bringing something of value. And you talked about value, the value proposition. I think that's what we have the opportunity to elevate the current capitalistic approach to marketing and selling products and bring the value and the ethics to it in a way where people want to purchase that. Because look, a lot of the, the big companies are bandwagoning. They're saying, oh, just copy these other people and what they're doing and use the same cheap, crappy materials and, and just put a nice dressing on it and vegan wash it like green washing, you know? <laughs> And uh, but we do have to get good in our messaging and our marketing. And I think that's a big key that you guys really help deliver, uh, you know, uh, coming from a David, coming from a marketing background. I can see how so many vegans believe in their product, but they're not communicating that value to the consumer by having a higher quality product. So talk about that for a moment. Because I think that's so important. Yeah, I after speaking with quite a lot of our members in the business clinics and things that we that we do, they quite often come with this problem with regards to. Mm. Um, I kind of I know what I'm trying to say. I know what I'm trying to do, but either I don't like it. Feels like selling. Again, comes back to that selling and not liking <laughs> selling, or I don't know how to communicate it. And even this week, we had a business clinic um, yesterday, and people were saying, "Well." Um, I know that it's going to help people. And if it was somebody else's product or service, I would be all over it. I would know exactly what to do and what to say, but because it's my own, I don't know how. Yeah. <laughs> Is this probably isn't something just, just for vegans, but vegans seem to have a harder problem, <laughs> have, have a harder time with putting all this together. Um, but one of the things that's made a big difference is, like you say, in, in this sector, it's so different. Um, you know, companies that would be considered competition in other sectors are coming together. And this, and again, in the same business clinic, we had somebody who was doing very something very similar, also in brand consulting, a brand strategist, actually in the same session and saying, that's great, let's just sit down and figure it out together. And this is somebody where they're doing pretty much the same thing. They're coming from different angles, but they, they, you know, they can deliver the same service. And rather than just sitting back and saying, oh, well, well that's another one gone. <laughs> she's saying, okay, well, let's work it together. This is great. I love your website. I love what you're doing. Let's make it work. Um, and again, we, you just don't see that in other sectors. Yeah, it is. Uh, and I think especially, you know, that again, Jeffrey, it's, it, it's lovely that point you were making about the importance of marketing. Like we said right at the start, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. 
people will sit down with a blank sheet of paper and go, you know, gosh, where do I start? You know, how do I write a marketing plan? And that's why, you know, one of the very first things we did with Vegan Business Tribe, um, you know, back when, when it was, you know, a completely free service, was we put together a 25 module um, vegan marketing course, you know, for actually how to market a vegan business. And, you know, we've got that there on the website for people to, to work through. And, you know, some of our members, they'll just go through the first couple of chapters and they'll say, this has completely changed my business. This has completely mm. changed my understanding of what I should be doing. I'm here thinking, should I be doing TikTok? Should I be doing Instagram? Should I be doing email marketing? But they've not actually worked out the strategy first for how mm. to connect with the clients and work out who those customers are. So yeah, you know, that marketing support is really, really needed. But again, it's already out there. That there are professors who, who've studied this for their entire lifetimes and careers. <laughs> there, 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 there are the young upstarts who have, you know, discovered new ways of marketing and, you know, blog about it every single day. You know, that there are tons of books and things like this. So yes, I think a lot of people don't quite understand what marketing is a lot of the time. And a lot of the time, you know, it is about sitting down, working out that strategy and then getting active in the right ways. <laughs> and again, you know, going back to another one of our, members at Vegan Business Tribe. He, he, he's, he's, he's quite a, a young lad. He's called Lewis. He runs a company called Avocado. And, uh, you know, it's an online card company. And again, you think, great, another one. But, you know, it, it, it's vegan. He plants trees every time someone buys a card. And what he actually did was he woke up one morning and said, okay, you know, when I talk to people about my business, they 100% get it. So I just need to talk to more people. So he got a huge sheet of cardboard. He made a sandwich board out of it. So, you know, he had a board of the front a board on the back and he just wrote down that avocado is a more ethical vision a, a more ethical version of moon pig and i don't know if you've got moon pig over in the states but moon pig is it, it, it's the biggest online card company here in the uk and he just walked out to his public park and he talked to people he walked up in this sandwich board and said can i tell you about my company he picked up 12 new customers in two hours of doing that. And he knew he picked them up from that because he was giving out a special uh, discount code when he was doing that. And I would ask people, how many new customers has your marketing got today? Has that got 12 new customers? Just from, you know, moving yourself out of your comfort zone and doing something that a little bit different. But he leveraged that through social media. So he had his partner out with him taking photographs. That got shared. It got picked up by his local BBC news team. They called him up. They invited him on his show to talk about his company and why he was walking around, you know, York and Leeds wearing the sandwich board. And he, he got, you know, 100 times more visibility than anything he's ever done online. And again, it's just by understanding what marketing is. And one of my huge bugbears at the moment and i think i'm probably going to start a, a whole campaign about this is we have got so lazy with marketing we think if we cannot do it from a computer keyboard and from behind behind our computer screen that we're just not going to do it it's going to be you know too much to do but that's where the magic happens because everyone's doing email marketing everyone's doing social media and if you can just step back and actually come up with a marketing strategy that again we come back to this world uh, this word remarkable that is when you can really differentiate themselves. And, and you and I, Jeff, you know, when we started out in marketing and trying to sell a business, you know, there was no social media. Uh, most people didn't have email addresses. You only had an email address if you if you worked for a large corporation, you know. So so we had to do things like this all the time. We had to take our our companies out onto the street and actually engage with our customers. And there is no um, mystery why some of the biggest businesses in the world, and especially the retail businesses, started out on market stalls. You know, they they, they started out with stalls at their fairs and things like this. You know, Red and Dead, Poundland. You know. Uh, you know, some of the biggest companies in the UK and the US, they started out selling from a market stall because that is the place where you really get to interact and understand your customer. You cannot hide away behind the computer keyboard if you've got someone stood there in front of you talking to you about your business. And, and as I said, we've got very lazy with our marketing. We, we're relying too much on the technology and not enough on the ideas. It, there is a difference in the marketing though. It's not just the old standard marketing 101 concepts where you are just busy trying to convince the customer to buy. It's really more about the message and how it relates to the consumer. What I call, uh, or what is being called, not just me, identity marketing, that connection to the customer, not just convincing or the selling. And I think that's what 
uh, uh, Lisa, what you were referring to is that a lot of the vegans are ethical based and, and feel like selling is like, oh God, that's so salesy. I don't want to be a salesman. I hate sales. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I think it, it feels Jeff, wrong, Jeff, you, know? you, you should I'm love sales. You, no, no, Jeff, you should love sales because every time you sell one of your products, you are solving someone's problem. Mm -hmm. You are making their life better. And so if you truly believe that your product makes someone's life better, yes. then it is your duty to go out and get that product into that person's hands and improve their life and that's what you have to remember and that's why you should absolutely love selling your product <laughs> yeah, don't, no don't don't get me wrong it's just <laughs> it's just how you go about presenting the information that people will want the product you know and and i think there is a slight difference way of the old way which is make the package look as pretty as possible make it as cheap as possible and put a star on there and a celebrity and people will buy it no matter what's in the package right you know i mean look at the cereal aisle especially in the united states uh and there is no nutritional value in that whole aisle yet billions of dollars worth of sales going on because of bright uh beautiful little packaging and stuff like that we're talking about an industry that is selling something that actually promotes health that is changing lifestyles that is doing something of real value for the people making their overall value of their own physical health better. And that's something you can't put a price on, but something we need to be conveying and, and why that's a little bit different than the standard marketing of the 50s, 60s and 80s um, to, to what has evolved into now, is, which is more transparency, more talking about the actual value to the consumer and benefit to the consumer. Uh, not just price point and pretty packaging. Don't get me wrong. Pretty packaging is important. <laughs> I see so many people, vegans especially, with yeah, great yeah. products and horrible packaging that nobody will ever buy. Absolutely. I'm going to let Lisa talk for a little bit now because I'm starting to get a bit excited. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's um, you're absolutely right. And again that you, you were talking about identity marketing and things and how it's different now and the, the again going back to mindset about selling again it's so many of our members have have a problem with this idea of selling i think you know david did a podcast on that as well just because so many people were, were talking about that particular problem and again it's just reframing what it is so you're not selling you're helping huh? You're genuinely trying to help people with your product or service. And if you can start to drum this into yourself, then actually when you're doing your elevator pitch or you're putting together your strategy for your marketing or you're doing your social media content or you're doing a little video for your Instagram story, whatever it is that you're doing, it completely reframes your entire yeah. messaging because you're no longer push, 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 sell, sell, sell. When are you going to buy this thing? You know, <laughs> to, or I haven't made a sale this month. Why is nobody buying? anything it's like well because you're trying to you you are actually trying to sell and you've convinced yeah, yourself right. you're trying to sell and now you're doing it really badly because a yeah. you hate selling and b you're trying to sell <laughs> so yeah. just put the selling to one side realize that you're trying to help really yes. embrace that and find those people who want your help and really start to make those kinds of connections and, and, and i think i mean just to jump in on what lisa was saying there and i think another problem that people find is they try and sell too soon without understanding the whole you know the the sales and marketing funnel and people's consumer buying timelines and things like this and um, you know we, we, we will have people who put together say a social media advert and they'll get plenty of clicks on it they'll get plenty of throughput but the same but we just don't make any sales and we'll say well if i was to walk up to you in the street and just try and sell you something and you don't know who i am and you've never met me you know would you buy something from me and of, mm -hmm. of course you wouldn't you know so it, it, yeah, exactly yeah and it's the same with marketing you know you have to understand the marketing funnel and this is why we, we we you know we primarily put together the vegan marketing course you know just to teach people this that you know you, you've got three stages to a funnel and right at the top is just that awareness you cannot get someone to jump from awareness to buying to, from you without going through that whole evaluation stage first you have to build up that familiarity you have to build up that trust with the customer you know and you have to be very aware of their buying timeline everyone has a trigger which makes them buy and that trigger might not come until 
until two or three months after they first hear about your brand. It might not come until two or three years until they first hear about your brand. But if you haven't got a strategy to be building up that trust with them within that time, you know, before they get to that trigger point, if you're not doing, you know, the email marketing to keep in touch with them, if you're not doing the just general awareness campaign so they keep seeing your brand in the places where they are, then by the time they hit that trigger point, they will go and buy from your competitor who's just been a lot better at doing that than you have. But all this, you know, this is the sort of stuff that only the big companies could do, you know, back in the 80s, the 90s, and the 90s. But because with the technology we've got now, you know, we've got the sort of grade of software, which is, you know, it's cheap as, as chips, as we say in the UK. You know, it, it, you're pretty much paying $5 a month for this sort of software, which will give you access to that kind of marketing uh, functionality that back in the, you know, 80s and 90s, you'd, you'd need a team of 50 people to do that. You know, it's all done, you know, with, 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 with an app these days. So, so, yeah, absolutely. You just need to get a little bit smarter about how marketing works and not try and reinvent that wheel. Do understand that, you know, lots of people have worked out buying psychology. Lots of people have worked out how marketing actually works and just getting a little bit of knowledge for, your, for yourself, that will make a huge difference to your business. Well, I, I think that's a, a good going thing. We have a group of athletes who are uh, pros, uh, multi-pro, uh, um, you know, like Karen and, and a Monk, and these guys are incredible at what they do, and they can help people prevent making state, the mistakes before getting on stage, because uh, there's nothing like going through a 16-week brutal dietary and training to get on stage and just do an epic fail. That's, that's, that's difficult, but getting a coach who can help you tell you exactly what to expect what's going to happen and keep you on track to get you on stage and actually place that's a whole different experience and that's the yes. difference coaching can make whether you're in business or trying to take the stage as an athlete coaching can make a big difference especially with business because for many people they're putting their life savings into the entrepreneur startup mm -hmm. and to have that failure come and to learn the lessons that way and have to start over all again you know, it's worth the money <laughs> to learn before. Absolutely, it is. Yeah, I'm, some I'm, other I'm, people. Absolutely, is. I mean, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to give a line now, which will actually hopefully stop that happening to people. But you should only ever put money into something that you have proven works to make it work better. You know, you, you, so when you are starting a business, and this goes back to right the start of our conversation about just testing, you know, making sure that something works, finding the audience first, you know, if you're putting your life savings into a business and you haven't proven that business is working either on a smaller scale or you haven't got that minimal viable product out there first, then you might as well just take your life savings to Las Vegas. You know, because you are just making such a huge gamble. And we do get people who come to Vegan Business Tribe and they say, right, I've got this wonderful idea for a business. I've just quit my job and I've got three oh, months yeah. worth of savings. And we're like, OK, right. Monday morning, call your boss. Get your job back because, you know, <laughs> this is never going to work. And, and you don't want to have that kind of pressure and financial pressure when you're trying to launch a business because that will just kill any creativity you've got it will kill any fun that you can have with building a business if you've got that red line coming up in in, in six to eight weeks that you need to be um, you know getting a wage back out of because it is so rare to see a business that will be able to pay its founder a full wage within the first two years of launching you know and, and people don't realize that people think it's all very sexy that you build this business the investors come along they throw money into it but those investors, they're not going to put money in until you've already proven that this thing works right. and they want to put money in to scale it up to make it work better. That's why they call themselves impact investors. And, um, you know, they know that if a business is unproven, they can come and put £100,000 into it and it, it, it's, it's still unproven. You know, it makes no difference at all. Mm -hmm. And that's why there is that fallacy of saying, yes, look at Oatly, look at Beyond Meat and look at these companies blowing up. They're 20 years old. You know, right. as I said, you know, uh, Oatly started in the 90s. Uh, Beyond Meat started in the 90s, you know, and it, it took Beyond Meat, I think, eight years to get their first product to marketplace, you know, that the, the, was this meat, meat, meat replacement product. So, so yeah, th there is this fallacy that we only see the good bits from businesses who are successful. <laughs> we only see the, the people who have, you, you know, already put in the sometimes tens of years of work to get to where they are, and we think they're some kind of overnight success. So, so yeah, absolutely. You know, go into it with a different kind of mindset 
Don't just throw all your money into something that you haven't proven yet. It's better to spend two years proving that 10 things don't work and, and you know, and still have the job and still have the life savings than just, you know, putting that money into a hunch. Yeah, my salary for the first four years of our eight-year business <laughs> absolutely exactly absolutely uh, yeah vegan business tribe for the first year it, it, it was paid for by the consulting work we were doing with the non-vegan companies so yeah at least used to call it our robin hood exercise which was absolutely <laughs> wonderful <laughs> yeah, yeah you know everybody saw our businesses grow launching new products and they're like wow you must be rich now and i'm like <laughs> no, no. No, but, but not, not making a penny. Yeah, yet. but not enough people talk about that. You know, you know, we all hide it. We we don't want to hide. You know, have that side of business. And we actually had a a, a a panel discussion on this about you know the things that we don't talk about in business. And this was one of those things. People don't talk about the money and the debt that they get into when launching a business. You know, they they don't mention that they they maxed out every credit card they could get their hands yeah. on to launch a business, and it took them twelve years to pay it all back. Um, you know, but you, you don't see that because they've got you know, a hundred thousand Instagram followers, uh, you know, so, so absolutely. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and again, you know, coming into a community like ours, talking to people who have built businesses, myself and Lisa included, these are the sort of things which is really, really important. And if I can stop someone losing their life savings because they just haven't tested their business first, or they, they, they haven't built an audience. They've tried to launch when they've got no audience to launch too. If we can right. just save one or two people doing that, then absolutely we have done our job. Thank you so much for what you guys are doing for the community. I think it's so important, not only just for a marketplace that's exploding and love seeing people, especially what you were talking about, mainstream folks switching over, even flexitarian, trying it, because every meal they eat that is plant-based, every time they choose a plant-based product or book or anything or service, they are supporting a community that causes less suffering in this world. So thank you for all the work that you're doing. It's so needed. Um, if people are interested in contacting you, following you, reaching out to you, or getting involved in Vegan Business Tribe or some of the other uh, projects that you're doing, how do they get involved and get in touch with you? Yeah, just come to the website. It's <laughs> veganbusinesstribe.com or send us an email at hello at veganbusinesstribe.com. Yeah. And one thing I'll just add to that, Jeff, um, that we don't often do this, but just because we, we, we've been talking for an hour now, gosh, can you believe? And, uh, so <laughs> if anybody is stuck with us right to the end of this, we will very happily, just as a way of saying sorry more than anything else, you know, we, we will very happily give, give them a, a, a free trial of Vegan Business Tribe. Now, we, it, it, it's not something we hand out, but if someone just wants to email, we haven't got any special codes or anything, but if somebody just wants to email hello at veganbusinesstribe.com, say that they watch this or just say that they're in your network. You know, we will happily, you know, give them a free trial and then they can come along to some of these business clinics. They can come along to the networking. They can take a look at the marketing course. They can join in with the seminars and things like that and just, you know, really get into the content. And we'd just love to do that for the people who follow you. Yeah, I, usually my podcasts are 20 to 30 minutes long, but this has been, I feel like I'm getting a little bit of a, a freebie myself. So. Let's keep going. No, no, there's, there's lots more to talk about, Jeff. We can do, we can, we can do another 60 minutes. <laughs> no, but uh, definitely, uh, thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you for sharing openly all the, the information and great insights. For those of you out there listening, uh, if you're listening, you can uh, follow us on Clean Machine Fit, so you can see it on uh, Facebook and Instagram. You can also watch this later uh, in bite sizes on YouTube at Clean Machine Online. What a special group of guests. Thank you so much for joining me. And um, I'd love to have you back at some, at some point in time and, uh, and uh, chat some more because you've got such valuable information. But Definitely check them out. Their services are worth it. Get some coaching before you get into business and uh, save yourselves the trouble of making the mistakes that so many entrepreneurs do and, and, and many ending up in failure. They want to set you on the path to uh, being successful in your business for the community, for the environment, and for the animals. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jeff.